<laughs> okay, so we're officially starting. I want to thank Eric and everyone from the Noise Factory. It's a real pleasure. We've actually been interchanging emails and messages for months now. It all got started with a collaborative video on YouTube. Hella fun. So I think, yeah, you, you made the, the track. Killer track, awesome time. 18 guitar players, no, and not 18 guitar players, 18 musicians in general, just jamming, have a, a ton of fun, um, keyboards, bass, and obviously the track, but just a ton of people just having fun. Um, so yeah, and that's what led to me being here. I've had, it's my first time here in Texas. I'm loving it so far. It's, it's a continued tour, a culinary tour that I've been having since I, before this, I was doing another clinic in LA. And I stayed there for like a week and a half, two weeks, had a ton of food, got here, <laughs> continued having great, amazing food, and I've just been having a killer time here. So again, a huge thank you to, to Eric for having me here. It's super grateful for the opportunity. And yeah, I'm gonna get started with a song. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna be doing, it's gonna be open format. So I have a few topics, but it's nothing too strict. If you guys have any questions about absolutely anything i'll try my best to answer it if not then i'll just be honest i have no clue what i'm talking about <laughs> so yeah so uh talk about a little bit of the production that you went into that song uh as far as like the orchestration the piano did, did you do all of that yeah I, the the song is pretty much all me um play the piano and everything i, I programmed it in gotcha. so i played the keyboard, <laughs> the actual computer keyboard, so I, I punched in note by note all the, all the notes, um, okay. everything, and there's just a ton of different instrumentation. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the actual orchestration, I, it's just been a ton of listening to different stuff and figuring out the stuff that I like, the different instruments that I enjoy. And in the, in the way, I started finding out, okay, so I like strings a ton, um, I like glockenspiel, um, not only because it sounds really nice and pretty, but it's right. got a cool name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the piano, like so, like that ending there. It's yeah. just, it's almost like I wish I played piano. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and pretty much that's it. I, I did pretty much everything. The drums are, are programmed in, so I did those as well, like nice. note by note. It, it's a trippy experiment to do, just programming all the drums, because by the end of it, it just looks like a bunch of different colors, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't try to make them sound as less robotic as possible um, since they're programmed in. Um, and yeah, like, I'll, I'll try to, let me see if I can get my mental space to the <laughs> moment where I, I actually wrote it out. So <laughs> it was actually, you had asked about Hurricane Maria, yeah. and around that time I spent about six to seven months without power, I, I, I'm from Puerto Rico, yeah. and uh, it's interesting because, I mean, yeah, it sucks not to have power, a bunch of like trees went down and all that crazy, crazy stuff. But at the same time, it gives you a lot of like moments of, of silence and pretty much boredom. So you got to fill all that stuff in. I obviously went into a lot of music stuff. Actually, I started learning how to program a tiny bit whenever I, I actually went to my girlfriend's place a ton. And I didn't have a, like a, one of those generators, mm -hmm. but her family did. So I went over to her place a ton and I plugged in my computer and that's when, okay, let's whatever, I don't know, like two or three hours a day that they turned the generator on, I would go, okay, let me try to <laughs> learn something new. Um, and I started fiddling around with different um, types of instruments like I, like I went, like I just talked about. Um, and then the melody started popping out. So the melody, it's a trippy thing with specifically this song because the first melody I wrote is actually part of the backing track. I don't know if you... Yeah, I don't have to go into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just fiddling around with a scale called harmonic major, which I had never actually played before. And I went to, okay, what's the best way to learn this thing? And I just started trying to create a melody with it. Um, and then when I actually started recording, making the first demos of the song, I felt, well, this doesn't feel quite complete, so I just made it into a, a backing part. So, yeah, now, whenever I I'll, haven't done these live, it's actually the first time I played that song to, to an audience, mm -hmm. so it's kind of trippy. 
Um, had a little bit of a flare up at the beginning, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, like it, it's going to be trippy actually doing it live with a band because there's the other guitar player is going to get to play melodies at the same time. So that might be end, end up sounding cool. Like, uh, you, you do have a band. Right? Not yet. I've spoken to a bunch of different people. If I did, then I would have brought them over for tomorrow's <laughs> playthroughs. Um, but hopefully soon. Hopefully okay, soon. Gotcha. I'm kind of working on it, looking at different people, talking to different people. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much it. I just I was fiddling around with harmonic major, and the actual song ended up not being in harmonic major, <laughs> but some of the themes are. Right. So it's it, it kind of opened up my brain to doing that type of stuff so even though the, the main theme might have stemmed from harmonic major but the other sections weren't so now i know that i can kind of do that not stick to the one scale but just kind of move around and that's a lesson in itself right there <laughs> <laughs> okay so um does that does that answer uh, the question yeah, yeah. okay so any other questions um, so, in essence, um, when you're going through your process there, you're taking, based off of your harmonic uh, major for that instance, you're taking pieces of what you've done previously and just continuing to build upon that. So as you've evolved in your playing, uh, how has your process changed uh, regarding note selection for your solos in contrast to your rhythm section? Okay, so I like to break a ton of rules um, when, okay. when dealing with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like obviously I went to school, I went to MI for a bit and they teach you, oh this is the scale that should fit over this, this is the, the theory behind it and why it works, um, and I actually kind of developed a whole system to break out of that. And I, I kind of went, I called it um, risky notes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a way of going outside, like that whole jazz fusion type of thing. Mm -hmm. And the way you do it is as many risky notes or wrong notes that you have or any notes that will cause tension, the, man, the, the more of those that you have, the more risk that is going to be involved in playing that scale over that type of chord or over that type of harmony. Um, and I mean, some people might say, well, why take the risk and play something that's technically wrong over the top of this? Because I want to. <laughs> because it's cool. I mean, you get new... Um, types of sounds and as long as you do it carefully um, it, it's fine to do. Actually I'll give you a little bit of a demonstration so okay I'm gonna play it's, it's gonna be a minor track and let me see which one I can I can grab I'll play okay I'm gonna do a scale called Lydian Augmented and you're gonna have five of, no, six of the notes are going to be technically correct, which to, to a point where you can stand, the, any of the notes are going to stand on their own and they're not going to sound too, too bad against the track, but one of them is going to be awful. <laughs> and the, the trick is, as long as you don't spend too much time on that note and you use it as a passing note and just go through it, you'll grab the uh, effect, it'll give you a specific sound because each scale has a specific structure to it or a specific, specific sound on its own. So what I like to do is grab that specific sounding structure and just apply it over different things. The ear will recognize the specific structure against this brand new, um, I guess, application or this brand new context. Um, and so yeah, yeah, as long as you focus on the good notes, you're pretty much okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about my approach to pretty much warming up, which is good for everybody. Um, so are you a guitar player as well, or just bass? Primarily bass. Okay, a little so bit of guitar. This will still apply, so we're good. Um, I think it'll, it'll <laughs> apply, hopefully, to just about any instrument. Um, but yeah, so my approach to warming up is I don't typically go for like the chromatic E one two three four types of warm ups like that type of thing. Let me take off the delay. Um, just because it's not practical in terms of it's not a musical type of it, it doesn't really have a musical application. You could um, based on like what I just talked about if you avoid the, the incorrect notes 
you can kind of pull that type of stuff out in a more practical or musical musical manner. Um, so what I do to warm up is I'll go over stuff that I don't really know too well. And that I'm, I'm very like jumpy, anxiety is my, my main setting. <laughs> so, and that's kind of translates as to why I like to go fast. It's just, mm -hmm. I'm jumpy, so it'll help me ease the jumpiness. So what I do, another thing I do to deal with that is I set the, the metronome mm -hmm. and that kind of gets me into a little bit of a meditative state and it helps me to just calm down and it helps me to go slow. And for me, I've had a ton of like issues with flare ups and inflammation on my left hand. Um, so that's another way to avoid that because now I'm warming up, I'm calm, I'm relaxed. Um, plus I can't really go fast if I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. So usually I'll just work on exercises or new scales or concepts that I haven't really worked out all that well. So again, it's, I'll give, it's almost like I'm tricking my own brain into going slow just cause, cause I know myself. I want to, I want to go fast. I'm like Ricky Bobby in that Talladega Nights movie. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just kind of work around that and I'll, I'll turn on the metronome and I'll start with slower subdivisions. I'll usually, I like the number 72 in the metronome for some weird reason. I don't know if it's the normal setting in the metronome and every time I turn it on, it just flies it, it just turns on at 72. Um, and I'll start with eighth notes and I'll do eighth notes for a bit. I'll crank it up to, well, not really crank it up. I'll crank up my hand to triplets. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll go a little bit faster than 16th notes, 16 note triplets. I don't do 30 second notes too much. I'm just getting into them again. <laughs> That's kind of exciting for me and septuplets and quintuplets as well. Um, but yeah, and that kind of tricks me into working that stuff out. So right now I'm actually working on a legato course. So that's what I'm using to warm up pretty much every day. So I'll just, I'll give you a demonstration. Let me grab my metronome from here. Hopefully it's not too crazy loud. I don't want to cause any damage with the <laughs> levels of the metronome. Okay. No, wait. Where's the measure? Oh, it's the biggest tab on the, on the Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so I'll bring it down to 72 because that's the number I promised. Okay. That's not crazy loud. So a lot now, like, like I said, I'm working on a legato course. So all the exercises on the legato course are in the key of C major. So I'll just run over the key of C major and I'll work out through each of the exercises within that course. One of them is just playing around with the order of notes. Okay, I'll stop this because if it'll bring, make everyone nuts. Um, so it, what it consists of, it's, it's called permutations and permutations are only, it's, it's a fancy way of saying variations. So I'm going to be basing everything on three notes per string. So all that means is you have three notes per each string and you're just playing the C major scale in that fashion. So for, instead of going and just playing the scale up and down, you can play around. So you have three notes. You have your one, two, and your three. So if you want to look at the different permutations, you can go one, two, three, or you can go one, three, two, or two, one, three, or th two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. And that's all the mathematical possibilities of, of doing that. So I'll go. This is the one I'm going to include in the course, which is one, two, three, two, one, three, and one, three, two. And then I'll just repeat it on the next two, um, three strings. And then I'll repeat it coming back down. And I'll do that for, I don't know, like five minutes, go up and down all the patterns of the, of the scale throughout the neck with the metronome. I'll rev it up to, to triplets, 16 notes. I don't know if I can do 16 note triplets with that one, <laughs> at least just yet. It's not in tip top shape, so I'm not gonna try to demonstrate it. <laughs> um, and then I'll just keep going through different exercises. I'll do something like, uh, like thirds, which is nothing more than you play a note, skip the next note in the scale, 
you go back to the note you skipped, and then you skip another note. And you keep repeating the same style of sequence. And this one I can do fast. <laughs> Um, that's actually one of my favorites. So whenever I'm creating any type of content, and this is cool if you guys are ever interested in creating your own like courses or whatever, I like to focus on the stuff that I like because I mean, it'll separate it from whatever else everyone's doing. Um, and it, it'll be more per personalized. Um, so yeah, that's w one of the approaches to warming up. Once I go over all the different exercises in, in the course, I'll, again, I'll leave the metronome going, and I'll just noodle for an unlimited amount of time, whatever feels good to that day. So something to the effect of, it's going at 72. I can't really listen to it, so I'm gonna move away. type of noodling, I'll go over most of the stuff that I like to use when I'm improvising. So I'll go into specific arpeggio patterns, specific scale patterns, sequences like the one I just did. And I'll just keep moving from there. Um, and that's pretty much it. So my thing for warming up, play stuff that, that's going to be musical versus doing some of the other scaly stuff, the more chromatic stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, I'm not saying that those exercises are, are bad, not at all, because again, you could make up a more practical application for those. And actually, I'll give you an example of, of that. I'm just going to cover that topic on its own, but um, since we're already in the topic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, a, just a minor bagging track. So a way you could apply that is you've got your minor pentatonic scale. And from there, what I like to do is insert all the notes that are not in the scale, but that are within the pattern. And this is a good way to spice things up a tiny bit. So where those exercises might come in handy is just and if you ever want to do some sort of like a fast run without thinking too much about scales, you can go into that as long as you resolve the, the phrase back into the scale. So back into the little pentatonic box. And that note right at the end. Um, so I'll play a pentatonic phrase. Go into the chromatic. And as long as you play end on a pentatonic note, you're good to go. So that's a trippy way of adding some, some spice into the whole thing. Let me get that back. So that's just one application. Now, another application I really like about um, those chromatic exercises, if you find a certain type of weakness in your hand, for me, and I think for a lot of people, just based on anatomy, um, it's these two guys. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of locked in together. Like if one doesn't go without the other. So a good thing to do is, instead of doing the one, two, three, four, just do one, two, one, three, four, the whole way. <laughs> And what you could do, treat it almost as if you're going to the gym and just work on the stamina every day. You could slowly build up um, to, to go faster or you could think of it more of a longer time doing the exercise or longer distance. So if you want to do it with distance, you go up, switch up, go up a fret and do the same thing. Up a fret, up a fret, you get, you get the idea. So you measure the distance based on how many frets up you go. 
Now for me, I like to go back down, so I gotta measure exactly how, how many frets I'm gonna go up. So I'll go maybe to the fifth fret, come back down, that's good for today. Do that for maybe a week, add another fret, add another fret, add another fret. In a couple of weeks, this is gonna feel strong. It's all, again, it's almost like going to the gym. Like after a few weeks, you start feeling stronger. <laughs> Same thing's gonna happen here. You're gonna start feeling the, the pinky finger getting a little bit stronger. Um, and yeah, it helps to just feel a little bit, at least for me, feel a little bit more secure um, with doing that type of thing. So that's some of the different applications you could do with the chromatic type exercises. Uh, how did you come to the decision uh, regarding these sections where they're a little more broken down and staccato based uh, with similar, let's say, too, too much chromatic feel? But the in those sections. Um, the, the main riff type of thing, like the, like that guy? Um, oh yeah, no, yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. like that type of thing? Yeah, but uh, some, of the, some of the other sections uh, were, uh, were a little more breaking down. The, uh, oh, the, more, more, the, more, the more, heavier more sections, the, uh, that type of thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I got to count it off because I don't really remember the specific rhythm. Um, but it's pretty much just playing around with, with rhythm. So it's almost like I'm doing a... A, a small bar of like an odd time in between. So it's okay. So it's triplets. It's a beat of five four. So it's it's uh it's six sixteenth notes. So it's three eighth notes. Okay. So it's a bar of 5-4 and then a bar of 3 eighths. So that's technically, that's more or less the way I looked at it. So it's almost like I'm switching between one thing and the next. It's okay. more of an exercise in, in rhythm than, than anything else, I would say. Um, yeah, I'm not like a huge rhythm guy. My brother is, so plug, plug, his name's Jan Rivera. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, I did get into it a, a little bit, um, so I, every now and again I like to revisit some of that stuff, um, which it's, brings me to the back to the quintuplets and septuplets that I got to work on. <laughs> when, you're, so, when you're writing stuff like that, do you write it and then play it back in real time, or do you kind of write it and then slow it way down and work it out and then bring it up to speed? It depends, but most of the times... And I'll, I can't even show you in my phone. <laughs> I'll make an ass of myself, but everyone will enjoy it. <laughs> like I'll, I'll go, I'll come up with different parts and I'll just record it, record a video of it as soon as possible. I used to do audio. The thing with, with audio is you forget how you were playing it. Mm -hmm. um, so if I record a video, I'll know exactly what I'm doing and I'll make a, like a little tutorial. I'll try to make it to play it at real time. And then I'll go over the, the part real slowly. And yeah, I definitely got to do that because if not, a couple months go by, I forgot the idea completely. Uh, how about uh, like something like Guitar Pro kind of thing where it tells you like what finger, like finger one or finger three or finger two or finger thing. Is that something that you've tried before? Um, I haven't, but f the, the first thing that comes to mind is it'll take too much time. So if it's... I don't know, let's say I'm here, I just sat down, I'm hanging out with you guys, I'm just noodling and, oh my God, that melody sounds kind of cool. I'll record it and then I can revisit it. So at any point, uh, do you ever like sit down and actually put the taps down so people actually can play your songs or anything like that? I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a responsible thing to do, um, but I haven't done it. Um, yeah. Usually what I do is I compose mainly in Logic and okay. that way, I'm, it's almost like I'm composing and creating the demo mm -hmm. already. And then I, I can, if it's anything like specific sounds or orchestration or some crazy effects or VSTs, mm -hmm. I'll already have the thing with, versus having to go back and then reprogram. Well, not reprogram because it would be programming in the <laughs> first place. Um, but yeah, versus having to do double the work. 
But at the same time, not really, because if you use something like Guitar Pro or Sibelius or any of the other notation software, you can transport the MIDI into it, which yeah. is what my smarter brother and some friends do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like the, uh, to me it has to sound good when I'm do you, writing. Do you keep your, your stems at all times? Like, or do you like at one point say, I'm gonna get rid of this session? You know, cause I'm assuming you send out stems to get mixed or do you mix it yourself? You know? Oh no, I, I have no clue how to mix. <laughs> okay. I, I've tr I try to make it as, as best sounding as possible because if not I'll I'll think the song is junk and I'll <laughs> just scrape the the project so for me it has to sound good Got it. Um, up to a certain point that's why I orchestrate so much around yeah. it because I'm dealing with exactly unmixed stuff mm -hmm. and it just sounds horrible to me the whole way it's like oh this doesn't sound full it doesn't full. sound like a like a done project still um, so I'll keep adding stuff to it trying not to put way too much um, into it, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, it's got to sound good to me. Right. Um, so yeah, any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Where can I see more of your uh, your work? Thank you. You just did me a favor. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Um, you can find me anywhere on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, especially YouTube. Not on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if my girlfriend Damn sees it. this. <laughs> you had a shot. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, so yeah, just look up Juan Antonio. If you go into YouTube, Juan Antonio guitar, bam, it should be the first thing to pop up. Thankfully. <laughs> it's, it's such a common name that it's, it's almost like we're all battling each other right. on, on YouTube. <laughs> Who has the right to the name? Yeah, exactly. Um, Probably the easiest way would just be to go to my website, juanantoniomusic.com and repeat that for the cameras there, over there, juanantoniomusic.com and there you can get all the links. <laughs> Put it in the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that, that way you can find uh, everything I just mentioned, the Instagram, the YouTube and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, but I think YouTube is my main platform. I do lessons. I used to do them on the weekly, but then I got hooked on, on, on doing the music and the album and I haven't stopped. I've kept putting out content the whole way, but definitely not on a weekly basis. I'm going to go back home now and I'm going to try to get back on the, on the weekly grind. Um, is so yeah, everything, is it. everything you played uh, from your album so far? Yeah, everything I'm going to do today is going to be, except for the random <laughs> droning right. backing track with the one chord. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. um, which, by the way, and this is, a, I gotta give all the great credit to Eric. Um, I have some records on uh, with me, so if I'm, I'm thinking we could do a, a raffle of some sort, so maybe we can do like by the end of the whole thing, grab some numbers and I don't know, give off like three, four, five, which is most of the people. <laughs> um, yeah, and give away some some stuff. Nice. Uh, I also have some instructional books available. We can toss those in as well. If you don't have any need for the books, because it's a guitar book, yeah. um, then you can take the album if you win. And if not, then you can grab the book if you're interested in the book. If not, just do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so, so the clinic primarily was supposed to be about playing outside. So I'll go into another little trick that I like to do, very simple trick to go outside or go out. I'll go over about two more of those. Now the next one is actually one of my favorite. Let me go back to the clinic patch because I don't know if you're responsible going to the, to the clinic patch when I'm doing clinic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one again based around chromatic stuff. Now all you gotta do, you have your your major scale. You're gonna play C major. Keep it simple. <laughs> And it's going to be the exact same concept that I did before with a pentatonic, but now with a seven note scale. So again, you have this spacing here. So what I do is I'll toss this finger in there. Oh. Why? No rhyme or reason. It just toss it in there as comfortable. So like that type of thing. Same thing. If it's, if this is the distance, then I'll toss both of those in there. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do some random thing on the C major scale and I'll use that at the top line. So, so you can do stuff like that and bring it back.
back into the scale. And that's pretty much the trick to playing outside or like, it's not the trick, there's a bunch of different ways of going outside, there's more complicated ways, there's more simple ways. Pick your flavor and yeah, dig it. <laughs> that's one of my favorite ways to go outside, I'll, especially on the, on the top string, but you could apply it over the whole thing. I like to do anything, add that little bit. Maybe you can use that to move along the top string. And come back down the, the string like that. I mean the scale, not the string. Also the string if you wanted to, so whatever you're free to do, whatever you want. <laughs> I really like your style. It's, it's like I, I'm, I really respond to a lot of legato stuff and you seem to like really have that flair, you know, like that Joseph Triani kind of feel. Oh yeah. You know, with just like, you know, having that you know, kind of like uh, pull off kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And I love that. And you do it so fluently. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's Thank great. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, at, at times I almost feel like I'm cheating just by doing that little chromatic thing at the top. Um, but yeah, it's, it's weird. I've always been attracted to, to, to legato. Yeah. Um, I used to do it in a very, like I guess, savage way when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so again, going back to the, I had a lot of issues. Right. It's because I was very hard-headed when I was younger. And instead of doing what I do now, that I just explain going slower and starting slower, warming up, and as soon as the hand starts feeling that blood flow, then I can start going fast. But when I was a kid, it was just like, no, I gotta go fast, quickly, now. Yeah, oh no, it's not, I can't get the, the part going. So I'll just keep going fast and try to get that part as fast as I can. And I mean, I guess it's sort of worked to a certain point, but I developed a lot of bad habits. Um, obviously, the body responded saying like, hey, dude, stop it. You're hurting yeah, me. <laughs> exactly. um, also, yes, you develop a certain type of technique and you can kind of go fast, but it starts getting very dirty. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of like craziness going in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I dropped that whole thing for a, for a bit for a couple of years. Um, I started applying more like economy picking stuff for, right. for a bit. Um, and then I just realized, hey, I missed that fluid legato sound. Yeah. So uh, let yeah. me get back into it. And another plug, um, and hopefully he'll come here if he's watching. <laughs> um, yeah, I met Israel Romero. Okay. Um, he's a guitar player from back home. Yeah. And I just saw him practicing and, and dealing with a lot of stuff. And this was back in 2017, I think. And it just, yeah, something uh, like a light bulb went up. It's like, hey, I'll, let me just work out stuff yeah. instead of plowing through it. And that first year, what I did is I didn't do any overkill. I just did 20 minutes every day of very specific movements. Um, so the one I did back then was like that move. And just kept moving up either in this direction or this direction. That's, that's very Eric Johnson right there. Oh yeah, I got a little bit <laughs> yeah. of that movement. Yeah, dude, it's so good. So, oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just kind of applied the same thing because that didn't come to me naturally right. at all. That's not a movement that was like, oh, hey, like, like my hand was just, yeah, I could do this. So I started doing more and more legato type slicks every single day, 20 minutes. And it took me, I don't know, about a year, like a full year of doing the same exact stuff. Some days it was fun. Some days, as you can see from my expression, I just went like, oh my God. Um, it was just droning and, and kind of awful. But after the two years, I wasn't stressing. My hand just could just move because it recognized the movements. Um, so yeah, I would guess it's just a matter of doing the same stuff over and over every single day without going overboard. Because um, again, going back to those crazier years where just being hard-headed and trying to plow th through, um, yeah, that just didn't work. It, it was, and I guess it, it kind of even happened while a little bit later when working with YouTube stuff, um, I have a lot of series on, on YouTube. Um, how to play like such and such and like Eric Johnson's mm -hmm. one of those guys like Mateo Sassato I have a ton of whole tour stuff on there um, and I would get as soon as I would find one technique that they would go back to a lot mm -hmm. I just wanted to do it on that day and that's just 
it makes no sense because it's like you've got these guys that have been playing this style for years upon years and you expect to get it in one day. Right. So it's for, for my type of personality and I guess brain, it's just that's what I wanted to do. But obviously that's yes, that's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I'm glad I kind of restructured that. So, yeah. If, if you're doing that, stop it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I, I mean, it's with that and just about everything else, patience is the key. Patience, consistency, discipline. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Just take it slow. Um, don't rush into it. And I, I like to call it programming the hand. You're programming in a certain movement. No, nowadays, like we walk around, we, we're not thinking left, right, left, right. Um, but at some point, it was like, we probably don't remember because we're all babies, <laughs> cute little babies. Um, <laughs> but but now it's like, hey, I, I'm not thinking that, right? Like that would just be a kind of awful. But but it happens. The same thing with running. Same thing with the hand. It's just, just just walking with the fingers. It's kind of the same stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. So let me go back into the topics. Um. Uh, Ooh, it's a couple of good ones. I don't know where to get started. Okay, so since I already mentioned the book, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the concepts within the books. I came up, or maybe just coined a term, I guess, um, scale weaving. And it's sort of what it sounds like. You're just intertwining different scales or concepts. It doesn't have to be just scales. And one good application that I like to talk about or use is just to use the, the pentatonic scale and adding one or two notes to make it into a different type of scale. Now, if you already have a certain vocabulary with the pentatonic scale, just by adding an extra notes, you can turn it into the minor scale. But the pentatonic scale is still there. You can just play that scale up and down, do your, I don't know, blues licks. That's not too bluesy, but whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, you could do like minor scale just by inserting this note here and this note here. So there you have the, the minor scale. Yeah, minor, yeah. But you could also do something like Dorian just by switching one note instead of going take this note and move it up here. And the pentatonic scale is still there. You can take something like Phrygian, same thing. Now instead of having, you take those two notes, move them down here. And obviously if you're doing it up there, you gotta do it down the rest of the pattern. And the pentatonic scale is still there. <laughs> So if you're a pentatonic bass player, I would suggest actually have a lot of these patterns. So if you want lessons or yeah. the book, um, yeah, this, everything's on there. I, there's probably some free patterns on my site as well. Just got to look up the, the video, maybe skill weaving or something. I can't remember which one, but there's definitely in the site. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm just looking at the pentatonic scale, adding some notes to it. So it doesn't have to be crazy difficult. And, and again, take it slow, maybe grab pentatonic plus Dorian for, I don't know, a month and do it, make it fun. Don't just go up and down and up and down, play a backing track, try to make some music out of it, create some, some melodies, try to make a song with that, not just move around the, like, the scale and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's a, a trippy little thing you can do. And it also applies to the major scale. You could do major pentatonic, so exactly the same box. And good news, like these are all the same boxes. You, depending on the uh, scale choices you like, like either caged or three note per string. If it's caged, same five boxes, and you've got all the modes, and you've got all the like pentatonic stuff and all in the same stuff. Um, you just gotta learn to reaccommodate those. Um, if, and if not, three note per string, same thing. Instead of five patterns, you get seven patterns and you get the whole neck. Yeah. Learn those ones and just learn how to reapply them all over the place versus, um, I don't even know how many patterns it would be. It would just be crazy with seven patterns, seven modes, 
by five would be 35 patterns if it's caged. Seven by seven, it's 49. Is that it? I'm not great at math. <laughs> <That's> either. <laughs> um, so yeah, instead of learning all those different patterns, learn the five or the seven and learn how to apply them in seven ways. It's a little bit better than yeah, again, going over everything. <laughs> Actually, if you look at the first couple of videos of him that kind of went viral, I guess, yes, on yeah. YouTube, uh -huh. he was actually playing a, a guitar very similar to this one. Yeah. So that's where at least the color <laughs> of the guitar and certain, I mean, the brand, I guess, <laughs> um, came from. Yeah, the, the pickups are a little bit different than what he used, but, but yeah, some of it is it's definitely based on that. So so, I so definitely so had a, a Guthrie Govan, like, Face. Face, exactly. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so since we're already on the topic, like I don't know if you're interested, but like some of my favorite guitar players, sort of like a chronological order of like my favorites. Um, I started out with Sack Wild, just based oh, on damn. like a lot of Aussie yeah. stuff. Um, so when I was about 12, that's all I wanted to do. My first guitar was actually a Les Paul that wasn't obviously his signature because it's expensive. <laughs> and it's heavy. <laughs> and it's heavy. <laughs> And it's got a big old like <laughs> neck. He's like a six four guy, so I think that's yeah. I think he's six four. Um, and then I kind of went into, um, if I remember correctly, I think it was like a Richie Kotzen phase. So that kind of started. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a leap. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it took me into a different direction. I got very hooked on a CD he has with Greg Howe and it's called Tilt. So that started getting me into more of the fusion, jazzier type of things. Yeah. From there I jumped into Guthrie Govan. Mm -hmm. um, I got into school, um, hooked on Guthrie and still a lot of Richie. And then I met one of the teachers there. I got hooked on him. His name is Alex Machacek. Mm -hmm. um, so another like, another right, right. turn. Yeah. yeah. And so he's sort of a crossbreed between like Alan Holdsworth and some Zappa stuff, like um, Frank Ooh. Zappa. Ooh, um, yeah. So very experimental, yeah. avant garde type like of that. stuff. I like that, yeah. And from there I jumped into Alan Holdsworth world. I stayed there for a couple of years and then I kind of tried to get all the stuff out of the plane just to not be a, a Holdsworth copy, although I did try to be a Holdsworth copy for a while. Um, and then I started getting into, yeah, a couple of years after that, I just kind of just was all over the place. And then I found Nick Johnston, who's a player now. So that was a very modern influence. Um, from there, um, that, that started getting me back into the rock side of things. And then from there, like, I, I don't know if you guys know David Max and Mitchich. So incredible, like, musician in general. Um, he composes like his arranging arrangements and songs are it's almost like movie stuff yeah and he does everything he he writes it he records it he mixes it and he masters the whole thing so he'll turn in the, the whole package like Four on his own right there, yeah. yeah um and then after that i started getting just into general like movie music so mm -hmm. max richter hans simmer a lot of the the newer composers and, and the last thing that happened, I, I went to, um, I started fiddling with synths. It's like, okay, so if I want to learn about synths, I got to get into EDM, I guess. <laughs> so that's probably the last left turn I took before having to get ready for the clinics. <laughs> so I started getting some synths, some modular synths, not, not the real stuff, just oh, okay. plugins. And yeah, okay. Plug. I don't have the cash for that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's a whole new world, and again, it opened up a whole new thing. So I, I got um, kind of hooked on, on Dead Mouse because okay. it's trippy because yeah. it's uh -huh. a lot of it kind of sounds still like movie music, mm -hmm. but with a lot of sense. So and that's why I want to learn about sense, try to get that into it. I'm not. I kind of made made a joke on the Instagram story once. So I think, yeah, I'm done with all this proc stuff. I'm gonna do EDM now. Yeah, that's just a joke. <laughs> it's like like 
Tron, uh, Daft Punk kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm going to get into it, I, I, what I like to do, I kind of like to get into the brain of those guys. Uh -huh. um, I'll replicate a lot of the stuff, just obviously, with, if it's sense, I'll program and everything. Um, try to get all the tricks and textures. I'm still ridiculously new at it, so I've been working on it for about a month or two. Um, and then I'll try to bring that into, the, into my world. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing at this point. So, I guess that's a weird kind of go around, around the whole thing. And in between, just a ton of stuff. I'm from Puerto Rico, so there's some urban music in there. I work a lot with urban artists back home. I do a lot of studio sessions. Um, so that, even though I'm not a huge urban music kind of guy, not at all, I never listen to it. Um, but it definitely feeds in because, I mean, it's an influence and it's all over the place. I'm just sitting in my bed watching TV and a car will go by. So it's, yeah. And then all the Latin stuff as well. And talking about influence, do you, I, do you have any influences that are like popular right now? Like, you know, like let's just throw out like Billie Eilish kind of stuff. Like, um, you know, even throwing like Nicki Minaj, Miley Cyrus, all that good stuff. Like, are you influenced with mainstream stuff right now? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, that's an answer. <laughs> I probably should be a little bit more into it just to see what's going on. Yeah, no, no, don't do it. Um, but I mean, it's always good to, to just listen and know what's going on in general. I, I never shut my ears to any type of music. Um, although, I mean, I'll listen to it a couple times. I'll try to see what's going on. Um, I also do some, some cover gigs, so that kind of helps to keep in touch with some of that music. Oh, okay. Um, That's interesting. So, yeah, there's just, there's piles of stuff going in. So you, you can grab a specific interval. You don't even have to think about it as an interval, just specific fingering. Um, so here I could do a minor third or just leave two frets in between. Same thing up here. So w what I like to call this is just like a symmetrical fingering. And what I'll do is play the exact same fingering going up and down on the same string. You can go outside, move it up a fret, move it back down a fret, and it'll sound something crazy like this. Let me go into clinic patch. <laughs> okay, so it'll go like. So you start getting a little bit That's of that. That's bucket hit shit right there. Exactly, so it's like <laughs> bucket hit, Sean Lane, a lot of those guys. Yeah, There's actually, crazy. Zach Wilde does that in the song Junkie, I think, that specific thing. Dimebag Daryl does it in, in another song. Um, I think it's Cowboys from Hell. I'm not 100% sure. Oh. Um, and yeah, obviously I like the Legato stuff, so I'll do yeah, the Legato. Oh, if you want to get even more crazy with it, you can move it up. <laughs> and just go nuts with the, the yeah. thing all over the place. Um, Jesus. And again, as long as you bring it back in, you're good, because if you just keep going outside, it's yeah, just, just gonna be awful. <laughs> It'll just sound like a bunch of gibberish. Hopefully it doesn't sound like a bunch of gibberish on its own. Um, the other thing you could do is pretty much the same type of thing, but instead of a, I guess, vertical approach and a more horizontal approach. So you can grab something like a specific fingering. Um, the first thing I, I learned this, I actually learned it for a piano player. Like in, in Latin music, you get the gang, 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 going up chromatically, and they'll do um, four different octaves. So one octave here, the octave between the two thumbs, and then the other octave here, and they'll just go up chromatically and land on the correct note at the end. So you could do the same thing here. I mean, I, they have two hands. I have the one, unless you do some tapping stuff. I don't do a ton of <laughs> tapping stuff. Um, although you could with this thing, just add another minor third. Anyways, um, yeah, you could do that and just move it up. And that it yeah. gets nutty as well. So that was my version of that gang, 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 which last week I was actually teaching a lesson and I noticed, hey, you could do the, like the same thing with just the one octave and kind of fake it. Obviously not with the distorted sound, <laughs> a little too harsh. Okay, so I'm gonna do one last song and I think I'll go over some more questions and then <laughs> we'll be done. <laughs> so this one's called Four Little Paws. I love animals in general. And this one's just, like I, I was just one day 
creating the intro and orchestrating it. And my cat, like I was alone in my apartment, my, my cat was just sitting there. And I went like, you know what, you're my companion right now and feeling kind of lonely, so let's dedicate it to, to my cat. For a little pause. <laughs>
All right, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, any questions? Um, yes, I love the uh, arpeggiation leading into like the uh, barred chords during the uh, moments of solos and passages. Uh, what inspires uh, that kind of uh, playing and phrasing, uh, uh, depending on the songs, of course? Um, it depends on the section. Was it the, like, uh, in the solo? The I can't even do the phrase now because the track's not going. That's how it works always. No, <laughs> uh, no worries. Um, uh, I believe it was probably in between we were hitting uh, this more you know, vibrato, uh, longer notes, and then going between a bit of a chord in between uh, arpeggiation. Oh, like so the... a little uh, bit like... That's always something I've, I've always tried to mess around with uh, in my own stuff. Okay. I never really, you know, figure out a, a good way to do that. Um, okay. Have you, any any suggestions on on uh, working with Yeah, and how, how about playing that decently? Okay. Okay. Um, so, I mean, half of it today was kind of improvised. A lot of it is planned out. So, there's about two solos in the in the song, even though the second one is sort of like an ad-lib type of thing. So when I wrote it out, it wasn't even wrote out. I just ad-libbed literally when I was recording. Um, but then I just try to do the same thing around that same vein. And as long as I go back into the melody, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm good. So I'll just practice some specific lines. And what I try to do is I try to set up a way to get out of the line, a, a way to get out of the melody, mm -hmm. and a way of going back in. So as long as I know where I'm going out and where I'm going in, I'm good. Um, and obviously I'll, I'll practice going out and in of the, uh, of the main melody, um, and then try to get back in. And if it's something like the, uh, that's just the chord that's going on in the, right. in the, yeah, in the, in the, in the track. So th I guess that's pretty much what it is.